please welcome the Minister of State for Digital and Culture, the Right Honourable Matt Hancock. Well, thanks very much for that, uh, that intro. I can, I can report that it's a completely blank uh, podium. There's nothing but my own speech here, and so I'm totally undistracted. Uh, and um, this is one way in which TV is different from radio. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, it's great to be here and take up this post as the minister responsible for what I think is a, a vital and a thriving and a cherished sector. Um, coming to, into this fresh and being hitherto a consumer of what you do, albeit increasingly in ministerial life, quite an unusual consumer of TV, I've always thought that there's a risk that because people so enjoy what you make and what you do, that they may take it for granted, the craft and the industry and the work behind it. When you entertain people and when you make people laugh or make them cry cathartic tears or when they're che cheering on their favorite contestant, and I mean the contestant on the TV, not the contestant on the stage as you were doing earlier, um, they don't always care to be reminded that for some people, and for you, this is work. Uh, it's complex and demanding work, and we don't take your work for granted, and we know that we are, you are exceptionally good at what you do. Uh, now, throughout its history, TV has been one of the UK's greatest success stories. In recent years, it's grown twice as fast as the rest of the economy. It annually generates over 13 billion in revenues, of that, the growing independent sector now contributes three billion a year. And more than just the official economic statistics, your work really matters. And this is my the central message that I want to get over today. Um, you're one of the UK's best shop windows. You introduce the world to our culture. You tell them who we are as a nation that we're hugely creative and inquisitive and innovative and silly when we want to be and daring. And the export market for finished programs, international commissions and format sales has more than doubled in size over the past decade to over a billion today. And that is because we are true to form at telling people what it is like to be British and talking to Britain about who we are as a nation. And I want to return to that theme in a minute. Um, you and your programs are among our most powerful cultural ambassadors, too. You're a calling card for our nation as we go around the world. Um, kids in South Korea queue to meet Peter Capaldi. Crowds in New York scream for Benedict Cumberbatch. And all over the world, people make their arms into an X and tell Simon Cowell, no one wants this more than me. And Frankly, we as politicians regard this soft power that you have in your hands as incredibly important. It is great for the UK. Um, but of course, I recognize that this is also a great time of great change, digital technology revolutionizing viewing habits. Um, and a as you said, I set out the importance of this synthesis between the creative and the cultural on the one hand and the digital technology on the other. And in some areas of life, this is new and it's disrupting tried ways of doing things. But of course, in TV, this has been going on for years, if not decades. Nevertheless, the challenges that it poses remain, but the opportunities are probably even greater. And that's what I really want to focus on. Traditional TV viewing in front of a box set now accounts for only around two-thirds of the nation's viewing time. It's perhaps ironic that as we watch families on Gogglebox facing a traditional screen, most of us do that. Most of us do that on our phones, our laptops, or our tablets. And if you want to keep your ringtone on, that's just fine. Um, so. This world is changing, and we recognize that in government, and we try to reflect that in 
uh, government policy. And what we watch is changing too. 72% of us now regularly watch short form videos on YouTube and elsewhere. James Corden's Carpool Karaoke, that Kelvin Harris video featuring Rih Rihanna, Hillary Clinton's latest spot ad, even back copies of PMQs. Everyone's taste is catered for, even mine. And if we want more conventional length programs, we won't necessarily turn to the conventional channels. Netflix now reaches 4.4 million households in the UK, Amazon Prime over a million. And I'm told that in China, there are more movies watched on mobile devices than there are on television. And that is the way things are moving here too. So there is this great disruption underway. But let's bear this in mind. This provides, obviously, a great challenge, and you know that. Um, but the most creative TV shows were made when the medium was very young. Series like Monty Python, the plays of Dennis Potter, able to experiment so freely and so successfully because no one was yet clear what the rules were. Some of those brilliant, innovative shows like Doctor Who and Coronation Street are still with us today, so it's easy to forget just how radical they once were. So this is, I think, a time of great opportunity as well. And the exciting thing is this. The toys are new again. The rules are being rewritten. And this can and should, therefore, be another golden age of creativity. And we want to support you in making that so. The three principles that I set out for all creative industries are no less important in TV than in others. And I just wanted to go through each three and set out what I think their impact is in TV. Um, first of all, backing success. In all we do, we want to back success where we find it and to build on and strengthen Britain's creativity. I understand that I'm taking over this post at a time when TV is hugely exciting and successful. I get that, and we don't want to put that at risk. So the new TV tax breaks, for instance, they're working in the first full year nearly 400 million was invested in high-end TV programs, a further 52 million in animation, 35 million in video games. We get the fact that these TV tax credits are successful. Amid this great change, public service broadcasting remains hugely valued in viewers' lives. In a typical week, figures show 84% of us will watch public service television, and the vast majority, 73% of viewers, believe it's doing a fine job. Following one of the largest ever consultation exercises in the UK, the new draft BBC Charter establishes the corporation's funding, its governance, its mission, its purpose, its scale, and its scope for the next 11 years, beyond the life of this parliament and the next. And the new draft charter secures, I think, the BBC's independence by taking the next charter review out of the electoral cycle and by creating a BBC board that has fair and transparent appointments, and the majority of whose members are appointed by the BBC itself. And by enhancing distinctiveness, accountability, transparency, and efficiency, it'll make sure the BBC continues to thrive. The new powers for Ofcom and for the NAO, new requirements on competitive tendering, I think are exciting, the partnership and the market impact, and new transparency duties on pay and genre spend are all important elements of that draft charter reform package. And, of course, the BBC will continue to enjoy an inflation-linked increase in the licence fee over the next five years. The charter also firmly embeds the BBC's historic duty to be impartial. And I want to say this. For liberal democracy to flourish, serious debate needs to be anchored in fact and with a proliferation of media voices, the role for our trusted public service broadcasters here is ever more crucial. And now, of course, public service broadcasting is only part of the mix. The UK has got a vibrant multi-channel sector delivering over 500 channels via free and paid platforms. Over half of the spend on content is now on these alternative sources. And counting investment in film and sport, the UK multi-channel sector spends over three billion on content in 2015. And on original UK content, they're investing 800 million. These channels and their location in the UK bring big benefits to the economy, including over 12,000 jobs and around four billion of annual gross value added. 
and the prestige here of the UK as the number one broadcasting hub in Europe is something that I am enormously proud of and which brings very significant benefits to the UK creative sector. Now, I know that many of you worry about the impact of Brexit. The EU referendum highlighted the need to bring this country together, and that can only be achieved by reaching out to, by directly addressing all of its constituent parts. And you and your industry have that within your power. And I just want to dwell on this for a moment. I know there was a poll earlier today on the impact of Brexit and what concerns you. I want to say this, your role in defining how we see ourselves as a nation and how we're seen around the world is more important than perhaps any other sectors. Throughout her history, Britain has succeeded best when we have been open and positive and engaged and outward looking towards the whole world. And you can help define Britain's place in the world today and bring the people of Britain along with us. Now, on the specifics of Brexit, we absolutely get the importance of the country of origin principle, the continuation of UK content's designation as European work, access to skilled labor, to funding, and to the central importance of the broadcasting industry in the negotiations to come. We're working on all these things as we prepare to negotiate Britain's exit. We want to celebrate and strengthen our preeminent role in broadcasting. UK success is here to stay, and you can take it from me that we are going to work to make that happen. So that's backing success. That brings me to my second principle, which is expanding access. It is a central objective of this government that everyone from every background should have an equal chance to succeed, an equal chance to access arts and culture, and in TV, you're already doing that, bringing culture, highbrow, middlebrow, resolutely lowbrow, it really doesn't matter. You're doing that and bringing it to homes up and down the land, and you do it every day of the year. But just as your audience is wide and diverse, so should your industry be. And while there's already a push for greater diversity on screen, which I applaud and which we'll continue to support, it must be matched by a similar drive behind the scenes among writers, directors, commissioners, executives. Ideally, this room would echo from a range of accents, from all parts of the country, from every ethnicity, from every class and gender. Does it yet? I challenge you. There is more to be done here, and I'll be along your side as we do it. The BBC move to Salford, for instance, has been a triumph. In fact, the first time I met Tony was on this agenda when we stood on a stage and welcomed the BBC apprentices. Um, on the move to regional diversity following the BBC's move, I see that, that uh, move to the regions as one I would like to see other broadcasters follow in terms of spreading people, production, and investment beyond London. And on diversity and social mobility, I also want to call out and mention some of the good work and the good practice that's in place. I was delighted to launch Diamond in August, and I'm sure that it'll go from strength to strength with your increasing backing. The BBC is on track to meet their 2017 goal of 14% BAME representation off and on screen. ITV have achieved a 14% on-screen BME representation across all channels. 85% of Channel 4's commissions now meet their guidelines on diversity. And Sky has achieved its aim of 20% on-screen and writing talent from BME backgrounds. But I challenge you in this way, too. New, new technology and distribution is making it easier to break through, but does commissioning yet fully reflect the diversity of our modern nation? This is a question on gender, on disability, on sexual identity, on, on ethnicity, yes, you're beginning to make great strides. But what about social and geographic diversity too? And I make no apology in holding you to a higher standard because a popular demotic industry like yours with such a wide and diverse audience should be leading the way. So reflect the country that you serve and thrive on Britain's diversity and look beyond 
the nearest horizon to the opportunities that it will bring to bring new talent and new capability. And I hope that you can show by example that people from any walk of life can get ahead if they've got the talent in, in TV. My third priority, which links to this, is the opportunities from digital synthesis. Now, there's a good reason that I'm the minister for both digital and culture. The synergy between art and technology has never been more important. And the link between our creative and cultural assets on the one hand and digital platforms and the technology to deliver it on the other is in my profound belief how Britain will pay her way in the 21st century. And TV is perhaps the best example of what I'm talking about. The pipes and the wires of digital delivery meet the beauty and the creative genius of the TV sector. Convergence has delivered exciting, disruptive new business models and program formats like the challenge of multi-platform media. Now, and in this, I'm very clear on our job. If a Wikipedia page is slightly slow to load, it probably won't greatly try the patience. If a program that you're engrossed in begins to buffer, it can truly feel like the end of the world. All the tension that you've so carefully crafted, all the gags that you have so delicately timed, all ruined by a crap broadband connection. So I am absolutely determined that our digital infrastructure must be world leading. And we've substantially invested in our digital communications infrastructure, both for mobile and fixed. Three quarters of a billion of government funding. We're rolling out super fast. We've now reached 90% coverage. We're on track to meet 95% of all premises by the end of next year. We're pushing out fiber too. It'll get easier and get quicker year on year. Um, so we have our role to play, and we will deliver on that. And then digital, of course, needs content. That nexus between technology and culture, the sweet spot of our future economy, um, this is where you have always thrived and always lived, and where it must, you must, as an industry, continue to thrive. But there'll, there'll be challenges, there'll be opportunities to reach more people, to open more minds, to embrace new technology, to educate, to excite, to entertain like never before. These three goals are a passion that I believe we share. I have been impressed and excited by the talent that I have met in the industry. I think that this is a great moment to be involved. It's a great moment to be in the UK, where we're delivering amongst the best in the world. And I know that as a passion we share in delivering on those opportunities, I will be by your side. Thank you very much.